Good morning, everyone. My name is Jemani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Today we've been joined by Council Members Grodenchik and Drum, both from Queens. We are here to hold a hearing on five bills. Four of the bills relate to affordable housing reporting requirements, and the last relates to LED. Intro number 305, sponsored by the Public Advocate, would it require HPD to report on a uh, biannual basis the number of dwellings and dwelling units created, sponsored, or preserved through department programs. Proposed intro number 336A, sponsored by Council Member Lander, would require HPD to periodically report on certain information related to the voluntary inclusionary housing and the mandatory inclusionary housing programs. Proposed intro number 942A, sponsored by Council Member Rodriguez, would require HPD to report on housing development projects. Intro number 1645, sponsored by Council Member Richards, would require HPD to report quarterly on the affordable housing fund and the mandatory inclusionary housing developments that fund it. Finally, intro number 427, sponsored by Council Member Drum, would add a definition for the words reside and residency to the city's letter law. It would define residency as spending 15 or more hours in an apartment in a typical week. With that, we're going to have Council Member Drum give an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Williams, for hearing my bill on a serious public health crisis facing many of New York's children, lead poisoning. Over 10 years ago, the City Council took action to try to protect children from the risk of being exposed to lead. But a recent Court of Appeals decision made it clear that more needs to be done. The Court ruled that a young girl who spent 50 hours a week at her grandmother's apartment did not, quote unquote, reside in the apartment. This absolved the landlord from any responsibility to abate the lead-based paint. Intro 427, 1427, excuse me, will resolve this issue by adding definitions for reside and residency to the administrative code. Now, young children present in a dwelling for 15 or more hours a week will be covered under the law, and landlords will have an obligation to remove dangerous lead-based paint. Families should not have to suffer through the pain of having a child exposed to lead. This bill fills a major public health gap in the previous code and will protect New York's children from the myriad health risks associated with lead poisoning. For example, lead poisoning can irreversibly impair a child's neurological development, cause behavioral disorders, and reduce educational attainment. I look forward to hearing from the administration and the advocates on this measure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember. I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Megan Chen and Guillermo Patino, counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst to the committee, and Sarah Gasolum, the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill our card out with the Sergeant at Arms. Our first panel, Mario Ferrigno, Assistant Commissioner, HPD. Louis Carroll, HPD Assistant Associate Commissioner, Merrill Block Wiseman, Assistant Commissioner of HPD, and Deborah Nagin from the uh, Director of Healthy Homes Program, DOHMH. Can you please all raise your right hand? Do your friend to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Do you want to come up? Are you going <laughs> to? <laughs> <laughs> Can we get another chair, Sergeant? Uh, we, no, we can get a, the, the big one there, one of the adult chairs there. <laughs> okay, uh, you can begin in the order of your preference. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Williams and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Louise Carroll, and I'm the Associate Commissioner for Housing and Centers with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. At the table with me is Meryl Block Weissman, HPD's Assistant Commissioner of Performance Management, Analytics, and Audit, and Mara Farino, Assistant Commissioner of Code Enforcement with the Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services, who will be available for questions at the conclusion of this testimony. In addition, we have Deborah Nagan from um, Department of Health, who will also be available for questions at the end of this testimony. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify on introductions 305, 336, 942, and 1645, which would outline new requirements related to reporting on housing production, and introduction 1427, which would add a definition for residency to the lead paint abatement law. I will also discuss the legislation focused on, I will first discuss the legislation focused on affordable housing reporting. This administration has taken historic steps in partnership with the City Council to increase transparency and accessibility for all New Yorkers. In accordance with the New York City's Open Data Law, Local Law 11 of 2012, HPD works with the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, do it, and the Mayor's Office of Analytics to publish housing data in a format that is publicly available for examination and analysis. As of June 15, 2017, there are nine areas in which HPD publishes data sets on the open data portal. Three for housing production and six related to enforcement. We are pleased to use this public forum to share what we've been working on and to raise public awareness and city accountability. HPD is voluntarily reporting a large amount of housing production data, including on projects, buildings, units that are counted towards Housing New York Plan. Data is presented on the Open Data website both by building and by project. If you search the Open Data website by using the Housing New York Units by Project tab, you will find data on a project level, such as the number of senior units per project. If you search using the Housing New York Units by Building tab, you can find building level data including house number, street name, borrower block and lot, building information number, community board, council district, and census tract in which the building is located. In addition, a search by building or project will give you the following information. Project ID, project name, project start date, project completion date, extended affordability status, prevailing wage status, the number of units within each average median income, and number of rental units. Also, you will find the number of home ownership units and the number of total units. Another function of open data is that it allows the public to create specialized searches and save them for future use and for the general public to access. For instance, Data can be accessed by district, by community district or council district. For illustration, we created and saved a housing New York by council district query, providing information at a glance related to specific council districts. HPD is committed to ensuring that this data is not only available for public use, but for public analysis, which is why open data is the best way to publish information as opposed to static reports. We commit to providing open data trainings for council members and their staff, and to always be a resource for further support on the site's data and analysis capabilities. Concerning inclusionary housing, as promised to the council during the mandatory inclusionary housing process, our interactive inclusionary housing map was launched on HPD's website on October 2016. It allows users to identify for the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program, one, generating sites and the compensated developments that purchased floor area from those sites, including the street address, block, and lot information. Two, the amount of floor area a generating site produced. Three, how much was transferred to each compensated development and how much remains unused, if any. Four, the stage of construction of that generating site, and five, the community board and council district in which both generating sites and compensated developments are located. For the mandatory inclusionary housing program, we just updated the map to include two MIH projects that will close this fiscal year. This requires us to provide similar information as we currently do for voluntary inclusionary housing. For these two projects and all MIH sites, you will be able to see the corresponding MIH development, including address, block, and lot information. Two, the amount of floor area in that MIH site. Three, the stage of construction of the MIH site. 
and for the community board and council district in which both the MIH site and development is located. Users of the inclusionary housing map can search by city council district to see all of the inclusionary housing production in the district of interest, or for information about a specific project, you can query by address or by borough block and lot. In addition, the layers tool lets users see other information such as underlying zoning in the, in, and the city zoning districts. While the data comes from HPD, the source of most of the layers in the map is the New York City Department of um, City Planning, and we thank them for their support in our efforts to put information out. Finally, users can find information about developers and contractors by searching data that HPD published pursuant to Local Law 44 of 2012. Pursuant to Local 44, HPD requires housing production project information to be published biannually, including project location, developers, contractors, city financial assistance, and affordability information. This legally required information can be accessed via open data, allowing for the public to analyze it through various meaningful lenses. We now turn to the proposed legislation. It is clear that both the Council and HPD are committed to transparency, and HPD agrees with the spirit of introductions 305, 336, and 942. We thank Public Advocate Letitia James and Council Members Landa and Rodriguez for putting these bills forward for further discussion. Much of the data required in these bills is now being published through the recently created Housing New York Open Data inclusionary housing map, and local law 44 open data. We are open to codifying appropriate provisions, such as the indexing of data by council district in a non-proprietary format, as proposed by introduction 942, and to further discussing what is not currently being captured, but would be meaningful to the council. HPD is also in the process of adding the administering agent to the inclusionary housing map. As I noted previously, HPD wants to ensure the published information is available for public use and analysis, so we will conduct council trainings and provide continued support for how to best utilize open data, the open data portal for analysis. We do have concerns about some of the specific provisions of these bills. For example, HPD would need more time following the end of the fiscal year close in June to collect and conduct a data quality review for the information requested in Introduction 942. We would suggest October 31st for a more realistic time frame. We also have concerns with the requirement to identify anticipated or considered development sites in Introduction 305. Publishing, possibly prematurely, our recommendations for particular projects would significantly impede the city's ability to finance the preservation and creation of affordable housing at the lowest possible cost. Such a list might encourage developers to demand exorbitant prices for properties near our parcels, thereby inhibiting our ability to assemble land for a project. Finally, as part of the process to enact the mandatory inclusionary housing program, HPD and the City Council agreed that an annual report on in-lieu fees and the affordable housing fund would be incorporated into the zoning text. Given that there is already an agreed upon reporting framework, HPD cannot support introduction 1645. Now I will quickly discuss intro 1427 on behalf of HPD's Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. HPD is committed to creating safe homes for all New Yorkers, and it takes very seriously any complaint related to lead-based paint. According to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, since 2005, there has been an 86% decline in childhood lead poisoning. HPD has concerns that Introduction 1427 would have unintended consequences that could greatly impact tenants, property owners, HPD's enforcement operations. Although not defined in Local Law 1 of 2004, the term reside is commonly understood to mean that a person lives at a, a location that is their primary dwelling. 
Local Law 1 includes several provisions that require the owner to affirmatively determine if a child resides in a unit. When a child under six years old resides in an apartment, there are a significant number of requirements imposed on property owners, including annual notices, annual inspections, and work practice requirements. If the tenant responds yes to the annual notice, the owner must conduct an inspection for lead-based paint hazards. If the tenant does not respond, owner is required to attempt to inspect the dwelling unit to determine if a child of applicable age resides there. Owners must also inspect for lead paint hazards when a tenant notifies them that a child has come to live in the unit or makes a complaint about a condition that may cause a lead paint hazard or request an inspection. The law also provides that tenants may not refuse or fail to provide information about child residency or refuse to ac access to the owner for the purpose of investigation and repair of lead paint hazards. All of these provisions assist in establishing knowledge by the owner of the presence of a child under six in units in the building. HPD also has substantial procedures for addressing lead-based paint. Due to the increased risk for children, our inspectors ask tenants if there's a child under six years old residing at the home at every in single inspection we conduct, and 311 operators are trained to ask if a child under the age of six resides in the home for any service request regarding paint. If a complaint is filed and the tenant does not indicate that a child under six residing in the apartment, but the inspector confirms that such a child lives in the dwelling at the time of inspection, HPD will conduct a preliminary lead-based based paint survey, and if peeling paint is found, conduct a second inspection to confirm the presence of lead-based paint. A lead-based paint inspection requires the inspector to test the paint using an X-ray fluorescence machine, which requires the lead content, which measures, excuse me, the lead content in the paint. The inspector must test any painted surface that has peeling paint and all windows and doors. Violations will be issued if a lead-based paint hazard is identified and the property owner will be advised about how to correct the condition safely, which includes hiring a company certified by the Environmental Protection Agency for abatement and a dust wipe contractor to follow up. If the property owner fails to address the lead-based paint condition, HPD will attempt to do so and bill the property owner for the work. Many of these operational standards also have notification components and are required by law. While we understand the intent of intro 1427, we need to evaluate how a definition of reside would be incorporated operationally into our lead-based paint complaint, inspection, and emergency repair program processes. With the proposed threshold changing from primary residences to anywhere a child under six spends 15 hours a week, it can be assumed that the department's universe of buildings would greatly expand. However, to what extent the impact of this expansion would have, it is not yet known. More time would be needed to appropriately realize the additional cost of the department related to staffing, office space, equipment, emergency repair work, and litigation. We look forward to continuing conversations with Council Member Drum on this topic. We thank you again for the opportunity to share the existing transparency work done by the administration and to discuss ways of ensuring that all New Yorkers can live in safe and comfortable homes. We would be happy to, dis to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much for the testimony. We've been joined by Council Members Landa Rosenthal and Rodriguez. I'm um, going to allow Council Members uh, Lander and Rodriguez to do opening statements. No questions at this time, though. If you have questions, we can put you on for questions after. <laughs> opening is? Thank you, Council Member Williams, and I'm sorry for being late. I want to thank you for your great work on housing cheer and for choosing to hear this bill today. Intro 942 will increase transparency in city supported housing development project 
an issue that I know many of my colleagues are concerned by. Often projects take longer than initially anticipated, leaving residents or communities in the dark about when they will be able to move into renovated homes. I introduced this bill because we on the council should know where projects stand in their timelines, who the developers are, and the, address, and the address of these buildings. Without this oversight or transparency, we do little to hold developers' feet to the fire when they let a project drag on for months or even years past the original completion date. When city resources go to support the housing development project, this project must be a model for how development is done in our society. It should mean strict deadlines are being met, worksite conditions are safe, employees are paid a prevailing wage, and that the project is delivered on time, on, a, on budget. Often these projects are for the creation or, resura or restoration of affordable units. Our city is in a homeless crisis, and the longer a unit remains in construction, the higher the chances a family is forced out on the street for lack of affordable uh, options. We owe, it, we owe it to our city's residents to address concerns over project delay. I want to specifically highlight that this legislation calls for the listing of developers of these projects so that we can see if any are consistently going over the projected timeline. We work to find those that provide quality on time work instead. They say that sunlight and transparency are the best remedies, and with this bill, I hope we can provide that to our city's housing development project. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, just a couple questions, then I'm gonna go to sponsors, council members Drum Lander, and then signed up is council member Rosenthal. Which everybody will have uh, five minutes. But I just want to make sure I clarify. It, it looked like uh, for bills 305, 336, and 942, you agree in concept and think you could agree with some modifications. Is that right? We, we agree. Um, yes, council member. We agree in concept. However, we already published much of the data in, that's required by the proposed bills. And so we feel that much of this data is already out there and it's already out there in, in a manipulative forms, for example, through the open data portal or for example, through the inclusionary map where you can find the address, the block and lot of both generating sites and compensated development. You can find the, the status progress of the development, for example, whether it's in construction, whether it's completed. Um, so we're already putting all this information out there. Um, so we feel that you know, if there are tweaks to what we're doing, we're, happily, we're happy to incorporate um, some of the council's suggestions into what we're already doing. Um, just for clarity, I mean, having out there, I guess, would make it easier to agree with us to codify it. I'm sorry? Can you having already, already having it out there should make it easier to agree with making it law to have it out there. So I'm going to let our assistant commissioner for um, performance and analytics respond, but we are already complying with several, with local law 44. Um, we have promised the council as part of the MIH process that we would have increased transparency, and we kept that promise by putting the inclusionary housing data out in October 2016, which is a few months after the council passed the MIH law. So we're, we're responding to you and we're putting um, information out there in response to laws or in response to your request. And so we feel if we're already doing that, if there are gaps in what we're producing, we're happy to add to our data, but we, we don't think that um, it's necessary to have it codified in a bill. So just, uh, I mean, there always seems to be a philosophical difference with most of the agencies. Uh, when we present bills to codify, even if it's codifying things that are already being done, I just want to understand that a little bit better. From our point of view, we want to codify it because uh, the next batch of HPD folks, all the people after them, 
may not be may not do as good a job as you're doing in a certain purview. So I just need to understand the opposition from codifying things that is already being done. So I will let uh, Meryl answer the question. So for 942, especially the point. Uh, can you just get close to the mic? Sorry. For, the, for, especially for 942, for local law, for the one that's related to local law 44, the points that were raised are all actually part of the legislation already. So our primary uh, we're definitely open, obviously, to discuss um, any of the provisions that were for to be codified. Uh, one of the main things that we're concerned about is the legislation calls for a specific report. The data that's required by Local Law 44 is actually incredibly complex and lends itself best to open data. Um, it is not something, because there's very complicated relationships, um, it cannot be created as a physical report. My team is happy to spend time, as Louis said, training or providing one-on-one -on -one assistance so people know how to use the open data. Um, but then the other provisions we're welcome to discuss, but especially the report requirement, um, I think is really counterintuitive to the, vol the type of data that is required for Local Law 44. Um, sorry. So I'm, I'm going to have the, the, the council members, I assume, are going to ask specific questions about the bill. Just in general, I want to stay on the point of yep. it seemed there was opposition to even codify what you're already doing. So is that, is that the case, even some of the stuff? We're saying that it's already codified in Local Law 44, so we're providing a lot of information that, well, that you're requesting for one bill. In, in one bill. Um, for example, the inclusionary housing requirements already codified in the zoning resolution, and um, we have agreed with the council ex on, on what we're going to publish as part of that process, and we put into the zoning resolution that the in lieu fees will be held at the community district level for 10 years, after which it can be used at the borough level, and that an annual report would be published by HPD. And all of this was um, in negotiations with you. And so we're saying some of the bills, have, the age of the bills, basically um, some of those bills are maybe three years old and subsequent to those bills being put out, we have come to arrangements with the council to put some of those requirements in the zoning resolution, for example, or we're publishing voluntarily through open data or we're already publishing through local law 44. So, um, so for 1645, that's the Councilman Richards. But your your opposition is because you're saying there's already a framework that was put into the zoning yes. law. Yes, and that framework was put into the zoning resolution um, in negotiations with the council. So we um, we all agreed that that's where it would lie, and we put it in the zoning resolution. And so we have in lieu fees that are published now um, that state how much the fee would be and when the fee would be changed. Um, I'm sorry. sorry. So we have rules out now for the in lieu fee that say what the fee is and how often that fee would be changed. But in terms of the things that you're looking for, holding the, the funds at the community district level for 10 years, after which it could be released at the borough level, and that we should report annually, all of that with your agreement was put in the zoning resolution. All right, well, that, the council member is not here. But, but, um, I, I imagine that what he's saying um, I guess either wasn't good or needs to be tweaked. Personally, I voted against it, so I don't, <laughs> I don't have a particular bearing on what we put in there. But my assumption is that if there's something else that's not there or needs to be tweaked, is the reason that we're, we're putting this forward. So are you saying that in 1645 it's exactly what was already put in there, or it's different and you don't want to change it? Um, the m main parts of the bill where the fund, the collection of the funds, where they will be used, for how long, 
for 10 years at the council district level, after which they can be used at the borough level. Um, a, an agreement that an annual report would be more beneficial than um, lesser reporting because we do not expect to collect a lot of fees as part of that program. All of this was discussed and placed in the zoning resolution. We also um, agreed through a side letter with you some of the specifics of what a report would look like. And, and we feel that because of the age of the bill, the council accomplished what it wanted subsequent to that bill and that um, we should adhere to um, what we accomplished together. Do you have a citation of where in the law uh, it's co this bill already covers? So there's a definition of affordable housing fund. The definition in the zoning resolution, I think it's section 23911, definition of affordable housing fund, um, basically states that um, the fund is administered by HPD. All contributions shall, use, shall be used for the development, acquisition, rehabilitation, or preservation of affordable housing, um, or as specified in HPD rules. Such contribution to the fund shall be reserved for use within the borough in which the MIH development making such contribution is located, and for a minimum of 10 years shall be reserved for use in the same community dis district in which the MIH development making such contribution is located. HPD shall issue a public report on the use of such fund no less frequently than an annual basis. For the provisions for the use of such funds may be set forth in the guidelines, i.e. through CAPA rules. And all of this was um, done and written in consultation with the council. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call up now uh, Council Member Drum. But just from your testimony, it seemed like most of the opposition had to do with how much additional work would have to be given on HPD. Uh, I'm also part of working on this when I was an organizer, tenant organizer. One of the first things we worked on was uh, getting local law one passed. So. Uh, unfortunately, we still haven't gotten exactly where we wanted to. But uh, Council Member Drum. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I'm sorry, I, I, I have three hearings this morning, so all back to back and hearing my legislation. But uh, what, is, what is the current definition of reside and residency in the city's uh, lead law? And how did the uh, Yanavith decision affect the definition, if at all? So. Um, there isn't currently a definition, and it is a dictionary definition of reside. But what the agency is saying is that the definition of reside may not be the issue. We've come a long way since um, the Yanaveth case um, in the way we approach inspections of units and in the way we approach prevention. And so what we're saying is if you put a bar, if you put a... a an, an amount of time. Somebody maybe who um, has a child 10 hours sudden who may have an issue doesn't have an opportunity to be savvy and when the HPD inspector goes by and says, does a child reside here? Anybody can say yes. And that is the end of the question. HPD will go ahead and inspect for um, peeling paint or other paint violations. If they find anything, they will require the landlord to make repairs. What we're saying is, Let's have a discussion with the Department of Health. Let's have a discussion with HPD to see what the right tool is um, in today's world as opposed to when that case occurred back in 1982 under a prior local law. So what is uh, currently required of landlords uh, to remediate lead-based paint hazards in apartments of young children? So I will turn to um, Mario Ferrigno to answer that question. So when the department receives a 311 complaint and the tenant indicates that the child under six resides in the apartment, uh, our lead program will go out and conduct an inspection uh, using uh, XRF testing. Uh, if a violation is issued for a lead paint hazard, uh, landlord is required to, to hire an EPA certified contractor um, to uh, have the, uh, the contractors has to have the work done with uh, using safe work practices. Uh, the owner is also, once the work is done, required to hire an independent EPA certified contractor to perform dust clearance tests. 
all of such documents uh, are to be submitted to HPD for consideration of the removal of the violations, which we will have to inspect. Um, does HPD conduct audits for compliance with Local Law 1? HPD will, will is audits of what you have a specific. Do you, um, how do you enforce it? We will issue the violations, conduct re-inspections, uh, conduct uh, you know, follow-up inspections, uh, proactive inspections. Uh, um, when access is not achieved, our emergency repair program is out trying to uh, do emergency repairs where the owner has not uh, uh, submitted to us documentation that the uh, violations have been corrected or submitted a certification that they have used, uh, submitted the proper documentation. Um, can you tell us how many violations for local law one have been issued in 2015 or 16? Um, I, I can tell you in FY16 we issued uh, 11,567 violations. So looking at the report from 2015, I see that um, it appears that very few violations are issued for Queens. It seems the highest concentration is in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. Can you explain why? the uh, numbers are so low for Queens? Well, we, our inspections are generated by 311 complaints, so I don't have the exact answer. I assume that uh, since Queens is, has more uh, one and two family homes, the complaint uh, intake is less. Well, in my district, which is um, uh, one of the most densely populated districts, <coughs> District 25, mostly uh, apartment buildings, for example, it has from zero to 110 Violations. Is there any um, explanation for that? Uh, at this point, no, but we could certainly get back to uh, research, you know, the complaint activity from your district. And, and, and so just, and just the last one, how do you do um, education for the public on uh, lead paint poisoning and how to go about reporting lead paint? Right. So uh, HPD inspectors carry uh, brochures, pamphlets, which are handed out to tenants upon inspection. Um, in addition, our website has, uh, as, as well as the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's website, has uh, a lot of information uh, regarding lead paint hazards and how to prevent. Okay. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you to the HPD team. I know uh, this was a lot of work, uh, so I want to start by appreciating that. And actually, you know, the legislation that I introduced, I actually uh, drafted after a report my office did back in 2013, before MIH was created, we did a a study to try to understand how the voluntary programs were and weren't working and found it very difficult to get the data. Uh, and that's why we originally introduced this language for the voluntary program. We went ahead and, and uh, amended it to include the mandatory program. But uh, you have indeed made a lot of improvements. Um, and I know that that's been a lot of work. One of the challenges we found is that you had good information on the generating sites, uh, but the compensated developments were hard to track, and I'm sure it was a lot of work to put this together. So I want to honor and appreciate all the work that went uh, into it. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to add uh, administering agent. Um, I do want to talk through some pieces of it, and I guess just ask about it, I, you know, and I know it's brand new, and I feel like we're in beta testing, so those things that I say I hope you'll take in the beta testing spirit. Uh, starting with just two bugs, actually. Uh, I was able to do search in Safari, but the search tool didn't work easily in Chrome. So if you could just have somebody kind of check the different browsers. Um, and similarly, the, the dark blue of the address that appears in the box is hard to see, so maybe change that color. Anyway, these are just small beta testing, and I'm thrilled it exists, but let's get it right. Um, but I guess some more substantive questions, which are not in, in the bill, but that I think might be useful to try to build out, um, because it seems to me the goal of doing this is, is really twofold. One is to make sure for any individual site the rules are being followed, and the other is to, you know, have the analysis we need to make sure the programs are working um, at, to achieve its goals. So one relatively simple thing that would be helpful for the first one would be a link to the regulatory agreement or governing document um, 
so that if you were trying to look up what it was about a particular site, and obviously gathering them all and making sure they're all online is a different question, but where at least going forward or where we have them, uh, one thing that would be great to look at, maybe I'll just list all these things and then you can, I don't need an answer today, but, and we can, we can follow up after, but it would be great to have a link to the regulatory agreements. Um, there's some additional information um, that it would be wonderful to have. So for example, in the mandatory program, uh, which option, uh, which MIH option people took would be very useful to know. And it seems to me we, we really have four programs rather than two, or maybe even more than that. There's the old R10 program, the designated areas voluntary program. Of course, each of those is in a designated area. And then for mandatory distinguishing uh, area-wide applications and, and private applications, I think over time would be very useful to that second goal of digging down and understanding how's the program working, what might we want to tweak about it. Um, so I think adding which option, a little more specificity to which kind of program it was, and maybe even in designated areas, which area, um, uh, would that help us a lot to just figure out over time how to use this in an analytic way as well. So um, all those things would be, would be great if they, if, I mean, you guys can take a look at how, how easy they would be or how well they'll all be challenging, but how, um, so if you have thoughts on any of them, I'm happy to hear them. I'm also glad to follow up offline afterwards. Um, you know, I think it would be best if we went back and took a comprehensive look at the map and then we can talk with your office and, and walk through. That sounds great. I, I know I'm, I'm, it's very, it's going to be a useful tool. And I, I guess what I will just end with is, um, you know, the goal, the report that we produced was not about the access to the data. The report was, is the voluntary program working? Um, and the answer to that was mixed. In some places, better than others. It's part of what pushed us to uh, help adopt a, a mandatory program, uh, which for all the chair's particular issues, I think is a whole lot better than the voluntary program that we had, that is for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, for one, want to keep pushing us forward. You know, I believe then, I believe now that we actually should have a genuinely citywide program that every multifamily development includes some affordable housing, whether you get a density bonus or a tax break or not. Um, I think there will come a time to go back and look at the R10 and voluntary designated areas programs and think about whether we want to pull those toward the mandatory program. So the goal here is to, for today, is to, is to say thank you for and help uh, get an even better version uh, and then pass a piece of legislation that codifies the, the tracking. Um, but I think it's just a useful reminder. The goal of tracking that information is to help make sure the rules are followed and we keep evolving, uh, evolving the program to get better. So I'd just like to answer a little bit of that. Um, I, there was a time when the programs didn't produce many units, the voluntary program, and the, the administration and the agency went through tweaks in the processing and how we handled the program so that, you know, uh, we went from producing about 700 units to produ producing over 3,000 in FY17. We're consistently producing over a thousand units every fiscal year, even without 421A. So when 421A comes back, we expect to be back up in the, the three thousands instead of the, you know, a thousand five hundred units that I expect to produce this fiscal year. Um, so. In terms of is it working, the way we handle projects and try to handle closings in real time has um, greatly boosted our numbers under those projects. Um, I will remind the council that we promised you we would get an enforcement and compliance division together in order to make sure that people were complying with not only our tax exemption programs but our voluntary and mandatory inclusionary housing programs. And we did hire that person. We have an executive director. She's currently pursuing enforcement actions and litigation on the tax incentive side and is hiring, so we're checking off all the boxes for all the things you requested. Mr. Chair, can I have one more comment? Thank you. So I, I want to both honor that and keep pushing us. Yeah, uh, you know, you have taken and it done since, it depends how you look, obviously, you know, the, the 1987 program, you know, the R10 program produced quite few units, you know, up until 2006. That program uh, produced a lot more units in its next decade than that first program had produced in 30 years. What has happened since 2014 is, a, is an enormous amount of work, and I appreciate the agency's 
uh, significant improvement in the data that's available, significant improvement in your own internal processing and making it possible for developers to utilize all the programs, and of course the mandatory program, which I think is going to be a very successful producer. So I want to honor all that work. It is, of course, also true that the magnitude of our housing affordability crisis is, is probably bigger than it was in 2006 or 1987, and that's not because you guys haven't done enough work on the, on the, the IZ programs, and I just think continuing to take this good work you've done, honor it, and use it to push ourselves forward, um, you know, I continue to believe we can pull the R10 and the designated area programs forward with based on what we've learned in the mandatory program, and that we still should, I mean, this is for the subject for a different hearing, Mr. Chair, but the idea that every multifamily developer in the city ought to make some contribution to help with our affordability crisis, whether we give them a density bonus or a tax break or not, that'll produce uh, tens of thousands uh, of units, and we just have to keep working to get there. This data uh, helps us make this program work better, so I appreciate it, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you. Um, I concur with uh, most of what my, my colleague said. Um, I, I do think there's some, some good strides. Uh, I don't think we did everything that we could do. Uh, I think there was some good work, uh, particularly with MIH. I think we failed there uh, very specifically and intentionally by not including a true mandatory in all of the options that were there. Uh, um, Folks like me, I think, feel some sort of vindication because there are new term sheets uh, that do exactly what it was that we were pushing to be done in MIH and have received no information of why now the change of heart. But um, also, I think there's been success based against the numbers we said we would have, but those numbers, I think, were not enough, particularly on the lower AMIs. And so uh, we, we got to keep pushing because we are in a, in a, a tremendous crisis. Um, I do have some additional questions on the lead uh, bill. That's 1427, is that right? Um, does, does HPD conduct audits for compliance with Local Law 1? So, so we conduct reinspections. Um, Oftentimes or occasionally we uh, will not get access to do repair for lead violations. We will audit those, go back out and reinspect uh, to determine if uh, the lead work was done or if it's in fact uh, necessary for us to do the work. So we're uh, looking at those uh, open violations regularly uh, to see if A, they were corrected uh, and uh, B, if the owners used uh, the proper practices to um, move forward to remove the violations where they were corrected. Uh, how many violations for Local Law 1 have been issued in 2015 or 2016? Um, I believe I, I provided the number for fiscal year 16, we issued 11,567 violations. Excuse me, Council Member. I, I think we also want to add that um, the Department of Health makes referrals to HPD and HPD inspects, and I'd like to give the Department of Health an opportunity to answer. Um, I, we, we can uh, answer the questions about the, uh, the Department of Health um, uh, part of it, but we, we have a, we're, when there is a child with lead poisoning, um, we make a referral to HPD as part of Local Law 1 requirement, and we refer the building, the address. If we find lead paint hazards in the, the unit where that child lives, we're going to order them to abate that hazard. But the rest of the building, that whole address, gets referred to HPD, and for there, and Maria could answer that better than I, um, they're going to look at the rest of the building for related to, to local law. Right, correct. So HPD will receive the uh, referral from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we will audit the, the rest of the building to determine if there's a child under the age of six uh, living in any of the apartments. Uh, and upon inspection, uh, issue any appropriate violations to the apartments where there are lead paint hazards. Do you gave the number for 2016. Do you have the number for 2015? And how many violations in both years were the result of complaints? Uh, that information I do not have with me, but we can provide it. Um, based on your testimony, it seemed to be opposition to Councilman Drum's bill was primarily about how much time, how much additional time the department would have to add in terms of staffing, office space equipment. Is that correct or is it something else? 
we're concerned. Uh, so, I think operationally there may be some issues we need to work out, but primarily we um, are concerned that maybe the definition of residency is not today's issue, whereas it might have been the issue. Um, Say that, that again, the definition of residency. The definition of residency may not be today's issue mm -hmm. in terms of prevention and um, dealing with lead paint. Uh, it was an issue then for that case, but it's not the issue that we're seeing today. And so we want to be able to sit with the council and try to work through a bill that would address the issues from the HPD, Department of Health, and the council's perspective. And just the um, discussion of additional staffing is just an addition to that. What so would what, be appropriate? What are the, issue, who what would are the be issues you're seeing now? Um, so we have two of the experts from the division. We think that it would be better after the hearing for HPD and DOHMH and the council to get together to discuss this more thoroughly. Um, I, myself, am not an expert on, on this issue. So just for clarity is saying, though, the hours that the law says you ha in this case, 50 hours wasn't enough for the property owner to have to make any changes, that's not an issue that you see come up often? No. Today, if a question, if a question comes through 311 or a complaint comes through 311 about paint, um, HPD would say, does a child reside there? And there's no hours, there's no minimum threshold. If someone, a grandmother, a caregiver says yes, HPD will go out and will do the inspections. If they find peeling paint, they will do the test and they will send the lead team out. And so it's a broader blanket. Did that change after this case? No, it's been that way. So what happened during that case? I don't know what happened in that case. I don't know. The law hasn't changed. It's been the same. Uh, it seems a bit strange if, if we're saying there's no minimum threshold and the councilman put the bill in because of a particular case where threshold was used. As was explained, if, uh, a, if a call is, comes into 311, the question is asked about whether a child under the age of six resides in the apartment. Um, if the answer is in the affirmative, there's no follow-up question with respect to the so number of hours. I think in this case, what we're talking about is prevention, and with DOMH, it's cure, right? So with prevention, you know, in the case where you have someone who's already um, had lead poisoning, um, and the question uh, to the landlord is whether the child resided here, um, The progression of that case is unusual because one, HPD on the prevention mode wouldn't be asking the landlord how many hours. We wouldn't get to how many hours the child lives there. HP, the landlord would have to do the work or HPD would do it and bill them. Or on the DOHMH side, if they found lead poisoning, they would then in, send a referral to HPD and also inspect other areas where the child may spend time. And it's, and it's not 50 hours, it's five hours. So the way DOHMH is working with I HPD. I understand what you're saying. I just want to be, were you aware that this was the case that the council would be used to when he put the bill forward? I, I understand that this is the case, but it, the fact pattern of the case no, is I'm, not... No, I'm understanding, but I'm just saying if we were aware, I'm just su surprised that you can't tell me what happened in that particular case then, because if this is the case being used and you're saying that the law doesn't match up with what the law is, but now you can't tell me why it then happened in that case. It was, it was a different law, and the progression of the way the agencies work, this wouldn't happen today. So under a different law, um, I didn't, years sorry, ago. Sorry, repeat that again? Number one, it was a different law. And, to, and number two, what, what the way. What was a different law? Um, the local law won back in, I think it was 2000. Four. It, it, was it 82? Okay. I, actually, let me let the Department of Health. So that. Right. Sorry, just really quickly, I want to shout out. Uh, we've been joined by the Bronx Academy of Letters. Is this a high school? No, middle school. Middle school. You guys look grown. Welcome very much. Welcome. Hope it's a lot of fun. 
Sorry, please continue. Um, I mean, I think this is applying to the original Local Law 1. This emanates the Local Law 1 of 1982. Now the Local Law 1 of 2004, as you well know, has a whole different provision for identifying children uh, who are high risk living in pre-1960 multiple So they're saying this case was before 2004? Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, it, it was just decided. Yes, and the case uh, uh, and the case was related to a child with lead poisoning. So it will happen before '04, but decided after '04. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully you can sit down with uh, Councilmember Drum and, and and figure out what the actual needs are. If this doesn't match up, um, but I appreciate all of the work that you're doing on all of these areas, uh, even with the affordable housing. Even though we got to push a little further, but thank you very much uh, for your testimony. And we have uh, three people signed up for um, public testimony. I'm going to call everybody up at the same time. I know everybody's going to get along, even though one person I'm assuming is going to be in opposition. I don't know for sure. Oh, no. He checked in opposition. Okay. Uh, Matthew Shashir, uh, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corp., Paula Siegel, Community Development, Project of the Urban Justice, and Frank Ricci, Rent Stabilization Association. By Bronx Academy of Letters. Hope it was all you hoped and dreamed. Can you uh, please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee to respond to the council member questions? Yes. You'll each have two minutes, and you can begin the testimony in order of your preference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Matthew Shashare. I'm summarizing much longer testimony, which I'm putting in on the record. Uh, I'm with Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. I'm also counsel for the long, for, with the New York City Coalition to Analyze Poisoning. In this capacity, I've been involved in a lot of litigation over the failure of city agencies to implement the city's lead laws, as well as I submitted a friend of the court brief in the Yanaveth case before the Court of Appeals, which is the basis upon which uh, Councilmember Drum's bill has been proposed. I submit these comments also on behalf of UJC and uh, Nyperg. In 2003, in the New York City Coalition to End Lead Poisoning versus Valone, the Court of Appeals declared that the dangers of exposure to lead paint, especially the young children, are well documented and, propose, and pose a serious public health risk. While the city was on the cutting edge of prevention policy in 2004 when it adopted Local Law 1, the medical science makes it clear we need to do even more now to prevent children from the, protect children from the intellectual, emotional, and physical damage that exposure to lead dust causes at even vanishing low amounts. Thus, in 2008, the federal EPA issued rules that require the use of safe work practices in child-occupied facilities. And noteworthily, the child-occupied facilities definition in the federal regs is a location visited at least two days a week for a minimum of three hours each visit in a combined weekly total of six hours um, and a combined annual visits of 60 hours. This is far more stringent than what's been proposed in, in this legislation. Um, and assumedly, the federal standard was, was carefully analyzed. Um, I see no reason why any city standard should be less protective than the federal standard. The reality is that young children spend significant amount of times in multiple homes in a given week, such as when parents live in s separate residences. And from a child's health perspective, the damage that can be done from ingesting lead from dust or deteriorated paint 
can be just as devastating, regardless of whether the child resides in the dwelling or frequently visits. Um, I would suggest, however, the more significant issue for this council is the lack of enforcement by the city with broad aspects of the current law. And although the council asked the, uh, the representatives from the agencies earlier if the city conducts audits, I can tell you that the city conducts virtually no enforcement of three key aspects of the city's law. One, the requirement that at vacancy, lead paint on specified surfaces, window frames and door frames be permanently abated and that record be certified to the tenant and documented. The city does not enforce that, period. Number two, the requirement that landlords annually inspect the apartments for lead hazards and document that in writing. The city conducts no enforcement of that provision either, except where there's a lead poison child. Three, the requirement that safe work practices be used at all times when disturbing either lead paint or paint of unknown lead content, regardless of whether it's a violation. The city does not enforce that, and I think those are key issues that should be followed up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my colleague for uh, testifying on behalf of the Urban Justice Center. I am also testifying on behalf of the Urban Justice Center's Community Development Project. Uh, I'm a senior staff attorney in our Equitable Neighborhoods Unit. I submitted testimony about the bills as written, um, and I, uh, it's short. I encourage you to read it. There's a bunch of technical tweaks, but I want to respond to a couple of things that the agency staff said under oath up here that I think need to be addressed directly. It's wonderful that they are putting material on the open data portal. The open data portal is a technical tool. It, it spreadsheets, giant ones. Since they're putting that data in the portal, asking them to produce a report from that data should be a no-brainer, and HPD has staff that can do that. The community boards don't. Community advocacy organizations don't. So the annual reports would serve a different purpose and they would address a different audience and they would make the material that they're already putting on the open data portal accessible to a much broader swath of people who are impacted by the policies that they're apparently reporting on. The information's not transparent if it's presented in a format that can't be read. So I really wanna, uh, drive home to the council that you can ask for annual reports of the same information that they're already publishing in English instead of spreadsheets. That's fine. Um, the other bill that the I was very surprised to hear the agency oppose was the transparency on the MIH fund. The language in the zoning text simply says that HPD, and I quote, will issue a public report on the use of such fund. Nowhere in the text are the words, the use, defined. Uh, the Manhattan Borough Board, when they submitted their comments on the MIH text amendment, uh, requested standards that include for transparency, and again, I quote, eliminating the possibility that future administrations may have different priorities and can unilaterally change the nature of the fund. The City Planning Commission, in making its determination to approve the AMIH text, stated, and I quote, HPD will track in lieu, payment, in lieu fee deposits as they are received and report annually about funds generated, programmed, and spent. That would be great, but that is not what made it into the text. I don't know why the legislation is necessary, because right now, HPD is simply told to report on the use of such a fund and there's nothing to tell advocates what's actually been deposited in each district's account. There's nothing to actually make real transparency possible other than nice people who work at HPD who feel like it. That's not good enough. So I really want to draw your attention to the fact that this fund is really needed, and it's something that advocates have been asking about in the last year since MH has been passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to agree with everything they said. Um, no, not today. Uh, my name is Frank Ricci. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Rent Stabilization Association. I'm here today to oppose Intro 1427 for many of the same reasons that you heard HPD say. But as a practical matter, one of the services that we provide to our members, and we send out hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these notices a year, are the annual lead paint and window guard notice asking tenants um, if they have a child under 10 or under 6 
and which would trigger, if it's under six, it would trigger the owner to do an inspection of the apartment to see if there's any peeling paint. The biggest problem we have is tenants responding. So we have a, a procedure where we go through a second notice, a third notice, and then a, a reminder to the owner to go knock on the door just to get the tenant to respond. But the, the I think the bill on, for the hearing today is totally unnecessary because even if a tenant is watching a child, a grandchild, a neighbor's kid, whatever, for two hours a week or three hours a week, all they have to do is say yes. And that's gonna make the owner go in and inspect for peeling paint. And then he has to um, correct that condition. If there's, as you heard HPD say, if there's a call to 311 about peeling paint a child under six, they take it a step further. They go and do an inspection. They bring their XRF machine, which is, and many of them are flawed because the default on many of the XRF machines is the same number, it's, it's 1.0, which triggers a lead paint abatement when in reality it could be something much less than that. Most of the violations you see and hear about today are on door frames and door, metal doors because there is an ambient level of lead in, in the alloys that make up a lot of these metals. But so there's a lot of, and I would argue there's a lot of needless abatement going on in some of these apartments. But the fact of the matter is the bill for hearing today is totally unnecessary because it doesn't matter if the child's there two hours or 15 hours or 50 hours. An inspection's gonna get done either by HPD or the owner for peeling paint to correct the condition. And the final thing I'd like to point out is that you heard them, and I, I didn't hear any discussion on it, since the lead law was passed in 2004, there's been an 86% reduction in the incidence of poisonings in the city. And that's with them lowering the standard from 15 to 10, and now the action level is between five and 10. So by lowering the bar, the threshold, uh, every few years, the num incidence of lead poisoning has dropped dramatically, which is a big success story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did I, just, did I hear you say that there should be, we should do something that uh, includes additional notices? No, I said that right now what happens is the health department requires owners, if the tenant doesn't respond on the first notice, I see, which yes. a lot of tenants don't, they have an obligation to go back two and three times. I see. We, as a service we do for our members, we will send a second notice, we'll do a third notice, and we'll even do a phone call to the tenant just to get them to say, ask if there's a child under six or 10. Matt, I, I wanna, because it did, there was some logic to, I, I hear what you're saying about what the federal guidelines are, but what Frank and, and HPD were saying is that the, guide, the guidelines doesn't matter because it could be half an hour or an hour right now. Are you saying that, that, that that's not true? Well, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, I, I, I what HPD testified to with respect to their policy and practices is what I understand has always been HPD's practice ever since Local Law 1 of 2004 went into effect. And this may be one of the rare times that Frank Ritchie and I in public have ever agreed on anything. Um, you say the same thing to me all the time. Right. <laughs> But I, I see, I think what's important to understand here is, is Yanaveth, the, the, the issue in Yanaveth is it was a liability standard. And, and it was brought, it, 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 was, it was brought under the old local law one of, two, of 1982. And the issue was, and, and this has always been the critical issue before a, a leading case in 1986 called Juarez versus Wavecrest Management, is whether or not the owner had notice of the presence of a child and that triggered all sorts of obligations. And I think the court was very divided on that issue in terms of the duty to abate um, being triggered by the quote unquote residence of the child. And in fact, it was not a unanimous court decision. Judge Fahey dissented. Um, it may be um, and again, I think this bill is probably going to go through revisions from what I'm hearing. It may be that uh, the, the remedy here is to codify something with respect to owner's um, liability um, being triggered by residents of a certain minimal amount of time. But I, I would certainly agree that there's no reason to impose a minimum amount of time requirement to trigger HPD inspections, or a, and certainly not the health department inspections. I mean, it's, it's pretty well understood that a child could be there five minutes and ingest enough lead in the right circumstances to be lead poison. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Ms. Eagle, thank you for driving some of those points home, particularly the audiences of who the reports were for. I think that's a, a key part. Well, thank you very much for all of your testimony. Greatly appreciate it. Is this for the record also? We also uh, were joined by uh, Council Member Torres of the Bronx. For the record, we have testimony from the Associated Buildings and Owners of Greater New York and Public Advocate Tish James. And seeing no one else who wants to testify, this hearing is now closed. Mic check one, two. Everyone who is here, do not use the chambers to exit. Use the south staircase, which is as soon as you go out, it's to the left because there is a hearing going on. Thank you.